In this video, we're going to really drill down to try to understand enantiomerism. Here are a few things that you'll understand by the end of this video. The first is why saying that a molecule is chiral is exactly the same as saying that the molecule has an enantiomer. Secondly, you'll understand why pure samples of enantiomeric compounds have the same physical properties like melting point, boiling point, and vapor pressure. And finally, we'll get to the bottom of this interesting test for diastereomerism versus enantiomerism, and we'll understand why enantiomers involving only tetrahedral stereocenters differ in configuration at all of their stereocenters. The thing that makes enantiomers fascinating to me is that on the molecular level, this is as similar as two molecules can get without being identical. They have the same molecular formula, same connectivity, and same internal distances between atoms. They only differ because they're mirror images. That is as similar as two molecules can possibly get without being the same thing. Enantiomers are stereoisomers that are mirror images of each other. The most famous example of enantiomers, of course, are your hands. They have the same connections. The thumb is nearest the index finger, then the index finger is next to the middle finger, middle finger next to the ring finger, etc. But they can't be perfectly overlaid, and they're mirror images. If we put a mirror between these two hands, one sees the other as it would its mirror image. Molecules that differ only with respect to the configuration of a single tetrahedral stereocenter, here represented as the central carbon, are also enantiomers. And the thing I want to draw your attention to now that foreshadows something that we're going to see in a little bit is that reflection through the mirror interconverts the enantiomers and changes the configuration of this stereocenter. Let's say, for example, that this lettering corresponds to the prioritization that we'd use to assign RNS. Reflection has left C and D in the same place and exchanged the positions of A and B, thus converting the configuration from R, quote unquote, in the left-hand molecule, to S in the right-hand molecule. This illustrates the important point that reflection of a chiral molecule inverts or changes configuration at tetrahedral stereocenters. Here's a somewhat more complicated example of a pair of enantiomers. Notice, first of all, that these molecules are mirror images, since if we placed a mirror between them, each one sees the other as it would its mirror image. To verify that they're not the same, just try comparing configurations at these stereocenters. You'll notice that they're not the same, and in fact, at all three stereocenters within these molecules, the configurations differ. To drive this point home, we can look at molecular models of the two structures. This molecule corresponds to the enantiomer on the left. This molecule corresponds to the enantiomer on the right. Notice that if we turn this molecule to face the other, and turn this guy to face the molecule on the left, these are in fact mirror images. To prove that they're not the same, we can try to overlay them. Notice that these carbons, what's labeled carbon 4 in this molecule on the right, and the corresponding carbon 6 over here, look like corresponding stereocenters. We can line those up, and we can line the bottommost carbons up by rotating the molecules like so, with those two hydroxyls coming out towards us. When we do this, those carbons, as well as the two CH2 groups, are looking pretty good. The problem is that the hydroxyl here is located on the right-hand side of the molecule in this enantiomer, but the left-hand side of the molecule in this enantiomer, and so these won't superimpose perfectly. Where we would have the CH2CH2 group on the left-hand side of the molecule over here, we would encounter the hydroxyl carbon with an H and the CH2 group in the molecule on the right. So these are not perfectly superimposable. Just as a quick aside, one thing I've been careful to do is to show both of these molecules in their most stable chair conformation with two of the hydroxyl groups equatorial and one axial. One convenient way to show that these molecules are mere images is to assume the viewpoint here with the two chairs facing each other with their axial hydroxyls facing each other. The long story short of all this is that these two molecules are related as enantiomers. One of the points that the models can help us make is that the internal distances in these molecules are identical. I'm not going to go through and show you this in a pairwise sense, but we can show this easily just for the hydroxyls, and I'll leave it up to you to convince yourself that all of the other internal distances are the same in these molecules. Let's take, for example, the distance of the axial hydroxyl oxygen to the other two equatorial hydroxyl groups. In the molecule on the left, they're 0.456 and 0.429 nanometers. 
we can make the same measurements in the molecule on the right, and we get the exact same numbers, 0.456 nanometers and 0.429 nanometers. The distances are the same, but the way they're oriented in space differs because the two molecules are mirror images. However, all of the physical and chemical properties of the molecules are just dictated by these internal distances, not by their absolute orientations in space. Thus, we should expect the molecules to behave identically when they're present as pure enantiomers. They should have the same physical properties in terms of melting point, boiling point, etc. In addition, they should behave the same way chemically in situations where they're able to act as enantiomers. That is, in situations where they're engaging with achiral molecules or phenomena. We'll talk more about this in the video on the energetics of stereoisomerism. The point I want to make here is that enantiomers are equal in energy because they have the same internal distances between all of their atoms. Here we're just making the point for the oxygens, but this is true for every pair of atoms within these structures. As we saw for diastereomerism, there is a shortcut to identify an enantiomeric relationship between molecules containing only tetrahedral stereocenters. This is based on the idea that enantiomers differ in all of the configurations of their tetrahedral stereocenters. To understand why this works, I want to return to the point we made at the beginning of this video, that reflection through a mirror inverts or changes the configuration at a tetrahedral stereocenter. Let's focus on this molecule on the left for the time being, noticing that it has two stereocenters, here and here. If we reflect this molecule through the plane of the screen, the resulting molecule contains the right-hand methyl group on a dash, since reflection moves the wedged group to the back, and the left-hand methyl group on a wedge, since reflection moves that methyl group in front of the screen. This has the effect of inverting the configurations, and this is easy to verify with RS labels. We go from S to R on the right-hand side of the molecule, and S to R on the left-hand side of the molecule. Reflection through a mirror inverts configuration. No matter where we put that plane of reflection, the configuration gets changed. Now if we look at the molecule on the right, we'll see that it's identical to this molecule that we generated by reflecting the original chiral molecule through a plane. And in fact, without doing any rotation at all, you can see this directly. We have a wedged methyl on the left and a dashed methyl on the right, and the configurations of course match. We can make an argument here that because generating the mirror image inverts all configurations, two molecules that are the same in every respect except that they differ in all of the configurations of their tetrahedral stereocenters must be enantiomers. This example makes the exact same point. The molecule on the left is chiral. It's not the same as its mirror image. Consequently, when we generate the mirror image by reflecting through a plane, for example the plane of the screen, it's not going to be the same as the original molecule. I'll leave this up to you to verify, but that reflection through the plane of the screen actually generates this image directly. The structure on the right is the mirror image of the molecule that we started with. Because this is not identical to the molecule on the left, it's also the enantiomer of the molecule on the left. And so now we see why saying that a molecule is chiral and exhibits enantiomerism or has an enantiomer are always of saying the same thing. The molecule is not the same after reflection through a plane. 